An important part of the maintenance of a steam system is surveying the steam trap stations within the system. Surveying is the process of inspecting equipment to detect problems or malfunctions. Different problems may become evident as the various pipes, valves, traps, and strainers in a steam trap station are checked. Before you begin to survey a trap station, you should familiarize yourself with the normal operation of the steam system in which the station is installed. Make sure that the system's steam is pressurized and is reaching the trap station. You also need to know whether the system normally has a constant steam flow or a modulating or varying steam flow because the type of flow affects steam pressure. It's important to check both the pressure and the temperature of the system's steam. First, note the steam pressure and temperature at the inlet for the equipment to which the system is supplying steam. Then compare these values with the recommended temperature and pressure for the equipment. Usually, if the pressure or temperature isn't within the recommended limits at the equipment inlet, the pressure or temperature at the trap in the trap station will also be incorrect. Whenever this occurs, the source of the problem should be traced, so corrective action can be taken. Another essential task in a trap station survey is checking pipes for damage and leaks. You should also make sure that the drip line is connected to the lowest point in the steam system. The drip line must be sloped toward the trap to avoid pockets that might cause sluggish condensate flow. The slope also ensures that gravity will keep condensate from building up in the line and causing water hammer. The drip line must also be large enough to carry the volume of condensate that's being produced. It should never be smaller than the trap inlet. Often, condensate from a trap discharges into a return line, which should be checked during a trap station survey. The condensate return line may be elevated, as it is in this installation, or it may be placed low so that condensate can drain from it by gravity. Either way, the condensate return line must be large enough to carry the total volume of both the condensate from the trap and any flash steam that's formed. Generally, a condensate return line should be at least as large as the trap outlet. The back pressure at the trap outlet should be checked to make sure that it's not too high. If there's no gauge downstream of the trap, you may need to install a temporary gauge so you can check the back pressure. For most thermodynamic traps, the downstream pressure should not exceed 70% of the upstream pressure, but the manufacturer's instruction should be checked for the allowable back pressure for a particular trap. Increased back pressure will cause the trap to cycle open and closed more frequently, and it also reduces trap capacity. Likewise, if several thermodynamic traps discharge to a common return line, it's essential to make sure that the condensate return line is large enough to handle simultaneous discharge without developing excessive back pressure. For other traps, like this inverted bucket trap, increased back pressure may reduce trap capacity, but it doesn't otherwise significantly affect trap performance. Another task that's usually part of a trap station survey is making sure that the trap strainer has been blown down. If this hasn't been done, opening the strainer blowdown valve one full turn and then closing it will usually provide enough flow to clean out the strainer. Finally, you should keep a record of the trap station's performance or operating history. Reviewing the operating history may reveal specific problems that should be checked during a survey of an individual trap, or it may clear up questions about how the trap station has performed under certain operating conditions. After a steam trap station has been surveyed or inspected, the next step is to survey the individual traps in the station. Trap problems aren't always easy to detect, so a combination of different inspection methods may be used. Typically, a thorough trap survey combines information obtained by performing three types of inspections, temperature, sound, and visual. A temperature inspection is usually a good starting point for a trap survey. 
the temperature at the trap's inlet and outlet pipes should be in the normal range for the specific trap installation. Generally, the inlet should be hotter than the outlet, but if the outlet is cold, it could indicate that the trap has failed closed. Whatever method you use for a temperature check, you must be able to interpret the meaning of the information that you obtain. For example, a properly functioning steam trap is usually warm because live steam is unable to escape from the trap, while a cold trap is probably not working. However, a trap normally operates somewhat cooler when it's working properly than when certain malfunctions occur. For instance, a significant increase in the temperature of the trap could indicate that the trap has failed open and live steam is escaping. If the trap inlet temperature is in the allowable range, trap inlet conditions are normal. But this doesn't mean that the trap outlet conditions are also normal. Outlet conditions must be checked separately. If the temperature at the trap outlet is also within the allowable range, trap conditions are probably normal for the temperature inspection part of the trap survey. Trap surveys based on differences between trap inlet and outlet temperatures can be inaccurate in certain situations. For instance, if a series of traps are installed on a manifold setup so they discharge to a single return line, back pressure may rise because of faulty traps. But the back pressure will rise on all the traps in the system, good and bad alike. So a temperature inspection alone probably won't give reliable information about the condition of a specific trap. On the other hand, in piping systems that have sufficiently large return piping, a failed trap may cause no rise in back pressure, and the temperature differential would remain unchanged. So this is another situation in which measuring the temperature differential across the trap won't detect the trap failure. Another type of trap inspection is a sound inspection. It's performed by listening near a trap's outlet for mechanical sounds and flow noises that are associated with the operation of the trap. To perform an accurate sound inspection, you generally need to use some type of listening device. The device carries the sound from the trap to your ear and helps filter out background noise from other traps, pumps, and similar equipment that can make it difficult to obtain a reliable reading. Even with the help of a listening device, filtering out noise is especially difficult if several traps in a manifold discharge to a single header, because sound can travel from trap to trap through the piping, and a good trap could be telegraphing or conveying the signal of a malfunctioning one. So if you detect the sound of a malfunctioning trap while you're performing a sound inspection at a trap manifold, Keep in mind that the failed trap is usually the one that's producing the loudest signal. However, not even the most sophisticated listening device can help you detect trap problems if you don't know what sounds you should be listening for. Each type of trap has its own particular sounds during normal operating cycles and during failure. With training and practice, you'll be able to recognize the differences between the sound of a trap that's discharging normally and one that's not. Also, when an ultrasonic detector is used to inspect a steam trap, the frequency response of the detector may vary by model and manufacturer. These variations can affect the actual sound that you hear from a trap. But listening to a few examples of typical trap sounds will give you some guidelines that you can apply on the job. A visual inspection can be a very informative part of a steam trap survey. But as with other types of inspections, you need training and practice to be able to perform the inspection effectively. Begin by simply looking over the trap for condensate or steam leaks. Leaks typically occur at piping connections and at the steam trap's body to bonnet connections. Next, see if live steam is being discharged from the trap. This is relatively easy to determine if the trap discharges to the atmosphere. Of course, before you can determine if a trap is discharging live steam, you must be able to recognize the difference between flash steam and live steam. Flash steam is a normal condition in which vapor is formed when hot condensate is discharged from a trap. Normally, the discharge from a trap consists of a center core of hot condensate 
with a slowly moving white cloud of flash steam circling the outside. Live steam is produced in the steam system's boiler. It's usually discharged with more force than flash steam is, and it has no center core of hot condensate. If it's working properly, a steam trap should be discharging hot condensate with some flash steam. But if it's discharging live steam, the trap isn't working properly, and it must be repaired or replaced. If the discharge is intermittent, the cycle rate should be timed, and the time should be compared with the cycle time that your facility or the manufacturer lists as normal for that particular trap. Different traps have different discharge cycle rates. Disc traps, for example, are designed to discharge intermittently, so a continuous discharge could indicate serious problems. Float and thermostatic traps, on the other hand, are designed to discharge condensate continuously, as long as there's a constant flow of condensate into the trap. And although an inverted bucket trap usually discharges condensate intermittently, it may have a constant small discharge if it's operating at a very low percentage of its rated capacity. This condition is sometimes called dribbling. By combining the information you get from performing temperature, sound, and visual inspections that you make during a trap survey, you can get a good idea of how well a specific trap is working. Trap surveys should be performed on a regular basis. A trap's size, pressure, and workload will determine exactly how often a survey should be conducted. Keep a record of trap performance as an aid for determining if a trap has a high failure rate. A trap that fails several times within its normal service life should be investigated. The failures could be a sign that the trap was installed incorrectly or that the wrong type of trap is being used for the application. In most facilities, steam traps are removed from service and replaced as part of normal preventive maintenance. Traps are also replaced when they fail or malfunction. Sometimes, a worn or damaged trap can be repaired. In other cases, damaged traps must be replaced with new ones. Either way, you must follow your facility's procedures and take all the appropriate safety precautions. The exact procedure that you should follow to replace a steam trap depends on the specific trap installation that you're dealing with. But certain major steps are common. We'll look at a typical procedure for removing worn components from an inverted bucket trap and installing new replacement components so the trap can be returned to service with minimal downtime. First, close the appropriate valves to isolate the trap. Next, drain the lines and allow the trap to cool down. Then, follow your facility's procedures to lock out and tag out the trap. The body of this trap is made in two parts. One part is a cap, and the other is a cylindrical casing that the cap is bolted onto the top of. To inspect and repair the trap, we must remove it from the system piping. Unbolt the cap, then remove it, along with the operating mechanism and the bucket, which are attached to the inside of the cap. Remove the old gasket and discard it. Clean the gasket sealing surface thoroughly to prepare it for installation of a new gasket. Clean accumulated sediment from the trap body and its passages. Check the body of the trap for corrosion, especially at the inlet and outlet passages. The body of the trap, in our example, is in good condition, so it doesn't need to be replaced. Now examine the cap and the operating mechanism. If the cap is corroded, it must be replaced. Also, check the bucket for any wear or damage. Inspect the linkage, the valve, and the seat of the operating mechanism. In this case, the valve seat is worn and will have to be replaced. Now, install the required replacement parts, including a new gasket. Because manufacturers usually sell the valve and the seat as a single assembly, you should replace both the valve and the seat whenever either one of these parts is damaged. Finally, follow your facility's procedures to install the repaired trap 
and bring it back online. If you must replace an old or damaged trap with a completely new one, be sure that the new trap is the right size for the installation. A trap that's too large remains closed for the same amount of time as a properly sized trap because closing time is based on the rate of condensate accumulation, which depends on how fast the steam is condensing, not on the size of the trap. But an oversized trap can discharge condensate faster, so it opens for a shorter length of time than a properly sized trap. Over the same time period, then, an oversized trap will open and close more frequently and consequently wear out faster than a properly sized one. On the other hand, a trap that's too small won't be able to handle all the condensate that's formed. This could lead to water hammer in the drip lines, or more likely, in the steam system that's being drained. What does this type of discharge usually indicate about the condition of a steam trap? 